How's everybody doing? Good. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for coming. Um, hopefully, we'll talk about some interesting characters and how what our process is in writing characters. Um, Real quick question. So you guys, I'm assuming since it's a writing conference, we're all authors. Um, is where are we at? Anyone finished the novel? Anyone close to a couple of novel finishers? I heard you, you were paneling a little bit earlier, so <laughs> I, I hope so. I hope yes. I hope so. Um, who's just starting out brand new? Awesome. Okay. So yeah, we our ideas. They're definitely not a science. We some of the things that we figured out, and it works for us. And, I feel like when, when you're going to talk writing advice, every author you're, you talk to will have a different set of advice. And every story to publication is going to be a different story to publication. And so really what makes sense is to listen to all of it and then try your own method, whatever kind of speaks to you the most, and, uh, and, and you know, experiment with writing that way until you find a method that really works well for you. I agree. I, um, I think we'll start off like with characters. So we have both written in the middle grade um, genre. Maybe we should define a little. So middle grade, grade is like um, age group age range is what eight to thirteen yeah. is kind of the age range. So your Fable Haven um, series that starts off in that. I think it gets a little bit older. Um, the first book, or maybe the first two books of Harry Potter, were considered middle grade. The rest are more YA. So that's kind of what we write. Tyler's branched out and has written some amazing epic uh, novels now. I mean, I, all of my novels can fit in Tyler's newest novel. As far as <laughs> I, just, I have written 12. They can all fit into that. So it's, it's impressive. But a lot of our characters are, um, our main characters are boys. Uh, just That's just how it started out. Um, I have written a series with the main character as a girl, but um, we write primarily, that's where we got our start. Middle grade boy books, but they're not just for boys, just main character boys. I guess that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, how many of you write for children? Or write for, you know, so I guess there's there's like picture books and then middle grade and then young adult and then adult. So I'm just just curious to kind of. What's the range? Where, yeah, like, guys. like who writes middle grade? They feel like, yeah, 8 to 13. Cool. Sweet. Who writes like YA? Okay. And then adult? Wow, yeah. I don't know yet. Or yeah, yeah, maybe you don't know yet. I, I don't You're at the right know. place yeah, to figure it out. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, was um, do you want to? You can start. Okay. Well, I, I thought I, I wrote. I wrote some heavy questions out. <laughs> I read these. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little like an idiot up here. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, Tyler. Um, I thought it would be interesting to see uh, to ask Tyler and <laughs> myself um, what were some of our favorite characters to write, what made them interesting, and what uh, and how did that work? So what, if you had to pick your favorite character, um, who was it? Why was it your favorite character? What made it so fun to write? So I think my latest uh, fantasy novel for adults, The Thousand Deaths of Arter Ben, the main character is a is a con man, and his name is Arter Ben, and he was he was probably my favorite character to write. I definitely connected with him, his sense of humor, and uh, wrote a lot of myself onto the page. Um, I think, though, what was maybe the most fun thing about him was actually his relationship with his best friend, uh, as kind of his right-hand man, which my editor referred to as bromance. Uh, <laughs> and the two of them had this banter where, you know, they would get into a sticky situation and they would begin to, to banter. And it, that was what made it so fun was, was, I think, not even the character of Arthur Ben, but his relationships with other characters was what made him so fun to write. And I think that's a huge thing to think about when you're writing characters, is how does this character deal with other human beings? You know, what what sort of relationships is this character going to create? Is it easy for this character to create relationships? Is it difficult? Um, you know, do relationships for this character last long or do they fall apart? Those are the kind of questions that I feel like can help as you're creating and thinking about an interesting character. Who is your favorite? Of your, of so your um, I think my favorite characters to write are 
the secondary character, like the like like the best friend character. Um, I do love writing uh, the main character, and I, and I love the stories. I love my main character, like that. but there's something about a secondary character that brings out the true personality of my main character. So, for example, in the Potion Master series, it's Max, and Max is obnoxious. He says the wrong things. He gets in trouble. Um, I get the most complaints from readers saying Max drove me nuts, and actually. I, I like that because that's his personality, that's who he is. Um, but you see more of my main character, Gordy, you see his personality, he's able to evolve because of Max. Um, we've taught, we probably both taught classes on, on creating characters. If you think about some of the main characters throughout literature, especially with what we write, and if you, write, you look at J.K. Rowling, you look at uh, Brandon Mole, um, a lot of times the secondary characters can get away with whatever. They can get away with murder. They can do the most ridiculous things in the story, and the reader will buy it, and they will love it. But if the main character were to do the, to do the exact same thing, he would not buy it. If Harry Potter were to act like Ron, we would like, I can't even, I can't even connect with Rick Harry. It's so ridiculous. I Ron, wrote a book like that, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I wrote a book once. It was a manuscript, and um, the main character was a real uh, annoying kid. And my editors, like my agent and every editor that ever looked at it just kind of said, I can't root for this kid. Like, I, I, I can't, he's too snarky, there's not enough tenderness to him, there's not enough, he's just a jerk and he's annoying and I don't want to read about him. Yeah. That was all the feedback that I continuously <laughs> got over years of trying to promote this book. But if that would have been a, a secondary character, he, it would yeah, have been, they would have gobbled it, it up, they would have loved it because... Yeah, you're probably right. I, I mean, I don't know yeah. for sure, but... I, I think that's true. I think a, your secondary character can get away with so much. Frank's so, wise. You learn I'm learn from Frank. See, <laughs> it's the beer. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's a, a key point. Um, can I write a couple things down? Right away. Right. I was gonna say uh, I have this thing, and again, like Tyler said, every author has a different set of guidelines and things they practice, and it may not work. But this is the right way. This is the right way. No. So, <laughs> so, especially writing in children's books, middle grade, um, I would think YA as well. I almost think every, every genre, because I think this, this will help you. So if you're creating a character, there really is... Um, I feel like you're just going to draw Google's behind you. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I think you see my drawing. There are five things that a character should have. Uh, number one, he should have... This is going to be very vague, but a power. And I don't mean magic power. Um, it could be a magic power, but it could it, it's a talent. Something that he brings to the table. So in terms of Tyler's character they wrote, it's a snarkiness, but it didn't work for that yeah, one. But, yeah. but maybe it's his, his wit, his personality, his ability to disappear. He's just not you know, unnoticed, or maybe whatever. Um, a weakness. Sorry, I don't want to spin all the time. Oh, nice. You spelled that right. It's going to be weakness. Uh, weakness, something that that he struggles with or she struggles with throughout the story, and it's it, it would be great if they find a way to overcome that. A goal, and that can change throughout the story. I like to add a secret if you can, something that the reader doesn't know or something that he doesn't want anyone else to know, possibly, and then a friend. And I think we just touched on the one at in here. If, if they don't have a friend, a lot, most of my first novels that I wrote, it was a single character going through the adventure by themselves, and it was just blah, because no, there was no secondary characters to pull out the personality. And so, yeah, what you're getting is you're, you're not able to see, again, going back to relationships, if there's no interaction with other people, especially a friend or, or even a, an enemy or a frenemy, right? In, in middle grade, there's a, lot, there's a lot of that, right, where two kids that don't care for each other are teamed up for some unknown reason and they have to work past their differences. And that really shows character development because that conflict that, that, that these two characters bring is something that people will read. And, they, and that's when you get your, your witty banter that happens or your um, obnoxiousness. And it's, it's just great when to have some, like a friend of me, is a great idea. Mm -hmm. And my newest, my, my latest, latest book, Potion Masters, there's a girl named Sasha. She's a brat in the second book. She becomes part of the group in the third book. She's still a brat. I had to make sure she was still a brat because that's her personality. But she plays an important role. She's someone that they rely on, and she becomes a friend. But she's still a brat the entire time. You know, she, she says things. She's very snobby. Um, but I think that her 
behavior brought out the best in my other characters. Great. Um, I think that kind of segues to, uh, oh, question three. Um, how do you prevent characters from getting boring? Right? That's, I feel like that's something I we all struggle with. That's hard. That's a, see? I'm going to look stupid now. <laughs> I think that's a good, that's a great question because you, you want your characters to be exciting and interesting and not be like cardboard. I got told that a lot in my early stages of writing. This character sounds cardboard. And a lot of it is the canned responses they give in dialogue, I think. Yeah. Um, just a tip. Uh, watch your exclamation points when you're when a character is speaking or uh, reacting. If they're always exclamation points, they're always shouting the entire book, and no one does that. And if they do, we don't want to be around them. <laughs> you know, the guy just had the volume at max level nonstop. So, um, yeah, and I feel like sometimes characters start interesting. For us as writers, you know, and as readers, a character starts interesting and then they flatline. And like, and I think one way to prevent that from happening is just making sure that they have an arc, right? Like, where are they when the story begins? And where do you want them to end up? Emotionally, goal. internally? A goal. A goal, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and thinking about that internally, um, not physically, you know, they need to travel from point A to point B, but like, what do they need to accomplish um, inside? And I think that that prevents boredom in characters because if hopefully they're changing and they're moving toward that, then they're yeah. And for you guys, for everyone that's starting off writing and you're starting to try to find where your strengths are and what you're you know where you, if you're going to try to get this published or, or whatever route you're going to take, um, a lot of times everyone I think everyone does this. Um, I know so many authors they'll say yeah I got bored with that. Yeah. Um, I yeah. got I got tired of that and I moved on and it could be an amazing concept. But even the most amazing concepts, people get bored with it because it's probably something that's happening. So a lot of things you can do is mix up what's going to happen to the character. Really throw them in some really difficult situations and make them work their way out of it. If everything is just kind of you know going along and this is this is how they're going to react, I, I find some ways to mix it up. And yeah, which which kind of uh, leads to another question I have prepared. How do you deal with characters' emotions and the consequences of their actions? Because I got an email from a uh, reader a little while ago, and she was saying, you know, she's writing something on her own, and she was just saying that uh, a character in her story had been trapped, like uh, was captive and had been tortured, and then was released and got or escaped, and how she was wondering how to deal with kind of the PTSD there in, in, in that experience, like that really heavy dramatic experience. And she asked what my, because I have a character in the janitor series, the dad has been kind of locked away and is missing and he's been kind of hounded for, we don't use the word torture in middle grade, but he's been, <laughs> he's been questioned, heavily questioned. And uh, for information, yeah. And, and, and how, do, how did I deal with uh, that, his emotional, recovery. Well, my answer to her was kind of, I didn't a lot because I was writing middle grade, right? And it's, and it's a kid's book. It's for, you know, 10 year olds. And I, and I didn't, and he's a second, the dad is a secondary character. I really have the dad spring back with amazing emotional agility. And that, that probably wouldn't be the case. But if you're writing something a little heavier, you're writing for an older crowd, you have to start thinking about that. And if, if, if something happens, and, and I let me let me highlight some of my favorite uh, kids shows that have done this. Um, How to Train Your Dragon, well, which is just an excellent trilogy all around, but like the second one, right? Uh, spoiler alert! But, <laughs> but like you know, stoic, and they take a minute, right? And they have they have like a whole scene. I think I've seen it best illustrated recently in Netflix, The Dark Crystal. Uh, has anybody seen that? Yes, that's weird. Okay, yes, I'm going to. It's so good because there it's pup it's just all puppets and um, but, and it's written so well because anytime something traumatic happens to one of the puppets, they don't just gloss over it like, oh remember how your best friend just died? Like, you know, and then like, but we gotta get on with the action. They take the time to like grieve and 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 show how that character is affected by the traumatic experience that they just went through. 
without bogging down the story and the plot. Like it doesn't slow down. It's it, it's just really emotional and, and dramatic. They deal with it, and it becomes something that shapes their character without slowing the story down. I highly recommend uh, that series for for just like the writing was fantastic. It's a beautiful show. Uh, voice acting amazing. But but I, I love that as an example of something where you have co real consequences. And the characters have to deal with those consequences, but you can't slow the story to a grinding halt where they just like otherwise you get you get Harry Potter five, right? <laughs> which, which actually is my favorite. But <laughs> I, I know I, I tell people that it's great. I get the same reaction. Yeah, yeah. It's what brought me back into the oh. series. Yeah. But but right like like sometimes if the characters take too long, oh, yeah, like, moping around, nine hundred pages of you know, moping, yeah. yeah, then then it can really slow your plot and yeah. slow your story. And right? if that would have been the book book one, it would not be what it is. Right. You're already invested in the characters, yeah. so you can get away with more. Yeah, I think um, you have to depending on your your audience too, depending on the publisher that you're submitting to or whatever, they're going to have a certain opinion as well. I mean, you want to write your characters, so I'll give you an example. Um, one of my characters, he is a good kid, he makes the right decisions, but he was very, he was breaking a lot of rules. Um, and and he was constantly, and this guy kind of goes back to the whole secondary character, he was breaking a lot of rules, and my publisher came back and said, we, we really want to root for this kid, but we can't support if he's the one breaking the rules and there aren't any consequences to it. It's like he everything works out for the best, um, even though he's breaking the rules. Now, my secondary character can break all the rules, yeah. like you said. So there, there can be some rules broken um, by your main characters, but they need to understand what they're doing, and there needs. And I think the consequences are the best. When you see it, when you read a book where someone makes a huge mistake, and they're punished big time for it, that shows uh, that gives great character development. Yeah, yeah. And and I feel like maybe we can go as far as to invent this word. Well, I think we're talking about like rootability. Like how, how hard are you gonna root? Like, does this character have rootability? Are we gonna root for this character? Or is everything gonna go great for him the entire time? Yeah, and yeah. Like, eh. Because so in my, I'm, I have a book coming out with HarperCollins in about a year, and it's called Magic's Most Wanted, and it's about a kid who in, and I'll, I will actually be reading chapter one in the mm -hmm. reading in a couple hours. Please don't. I don't know if HarperCollins knows about that. <laughs> Uh, we'll get so, that out in editing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edit that out, Robbie. <laughs> so, so um, but, but in it, it's interesting because I had written this. In chapter one, you're going to see this kid commits a magical crime. He didn't know he was. He just accidentally activates something magical. He commits a crime, and then he's arrested and finds out that he's number one most wanted criminal on this magic organization. And then they're after him. Well, my editor just came back, and she said... I, I want to root a little more for this character. There we are, like rootability. Like why 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 would I root? Why do I care that this kid gets arrested in chapter one? So I so we actually did something that that your editor almost never asks you to do, and that is to write a uh, back history. Uh, 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 what's it called? A prologue. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 She Whoa. asked me to write a prologue. Wow. I know that like never happens. <laughs> Usually they say cut the prologue. Yeah, cut the prologue. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but she asked. She said maybe we could write a prologue. And in it, it was, uh, and maybe I'll read the prologue, or maybe I'll skip it in the reading. But it shows the the goal of the prologue is very short. Was just to set up that someone was manipulating this kid years before chapter one started. So there were bad guys lurking in his mailbox. Literally, there's a little tiny guy in his mailbox watching him in chapter one in the prologue, and he's like making notes and he's like making a report to to this evil criminal. Uh, and, and saying, like, hey, we've got our eye on the kid. This is going to work. It's going to be perfect. This is the chance we've been waiting for. And then suddenly, if you've read that, then when chapter one starts and this totally innocent kid gets arrested, you now know from chapter one that he's been set up, that he's been manipulated. You feel a little bad for him, and suddenly he has, a, hopefully, a little more rootability. Like, you're rooting for him a little more. Good. That's a dumb word. I just keep saying I like it. Like it, it, it seems like it's going to be cool in my mind. It's and not like every time rude, it comes out, like, are you the ability? It seems dumb. Let's write it down. Let's write it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write it in Sharpie. <laughs> 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 Whatever. I don't know. What do you do? Our rude ability. <laughs> well, that was not That's Frank's a, idea. That was Frank's idea. What? Right? I like it. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I got a question. Um, and this is for Tyler. Or a good word? <laughs> a good word? Or I'm going to need a word. It could okay. be like, are you needy? Ooh, Ooh, yeah. No French. <laughs> All right, so we talked about main characters, we talked about secondary characters. Um, I think one of the, um, the most important, the other important aspect of writing is creating interesting villains. Um, how do you make your villains readable? After, after writing, we'll be able to write that. Readability. <laughs> How do you make them readable? What do you do? What are some things that you've done um, to make your villain? Because there is a tendency, um, we have these stereotypes that we kind of classify our villains. They're the, what's that guy who, the train, he's always tying someone to a train oh. on the cartoon or whatever. Uh, not Dudley. That's, I was like, Dudley do right. That's not right. It's Dudley Whiplash. We, we have that in our head a lot of times. Um, and that's, usually that's a big no-no. We don't want to write a Snidely Whiplash as a main character. Unless you're writing a really young, it's obvious you're writing, it's for humor's sake. Uh, but you want some, you want something that's interesting. So what do you do? Or can you give us an example? Um, yeah, so my, my characters, my villains, I felt like when I, I had written five janitor books, and then two Wishmakers books, and Magic's Most Wanted, and two Arter Ben books. And I was writing the third Arter Ben book, and I realized that I didn't have like a really chaotic, evil character, right? Like I didn't, I had never written a villain who was just truly like pure evil, nasty, and bad. I had all, all of my villains in like my first 11 books or whatever had all been people who had motives and were willing to do bad things to, to get their. Yeah, you know, to, to to carry out their tasks, but there's they something endearing about. Them. But like a so, lot of people like these, like as as, as for as many uh, people as seem to dislike my villains, I had as many people in the story who seemed to like my villains and and would be rooting for my villains. They had uh, they had organizations Followings. that follow, yeah, followers and everything, um, and not just like minion created minions. They were people that believed in what they were doing. Finally, in book three of Arter Ben, I decided I'm going. <laughs> and so they meet this guy, and like their first encounter, they're at these like baths, and he's he's got like he's got one arm, he's got a spike on his arm, and he's just kind of crouched at the edge of the bath, just drowning a cat, right, for the sake of like feeling. So he yeah, he's pure. right. Like I decided to just go for like yeah, and he's just holding him under the water, uh, just because, and, and and the character's like why, and he's like yeah, I like to feel it, you know, and I, and I decided. I haven't written that kind of character before. It was just straight up nasty, uh, and awesome. so and so I went for it. In the yeah. book. That's awesome. All but all my other villains have been like really like sometimes even sympathetic villains, yeah. where it's like as the villain is dying, the reader's going, "Oh, I kind of feel bad for you, little buddy." <laughs> <laughs> like, like like Gollum, my favorite of all, yeah. um, oh. most complex. Like I remember reading those before the movies came out, and I was like so fascinated with this yeah. character who was so sympathetic. So pitiful, so and he sad. Had moments of almost redemption, redemption. Almost. almost. Yeah, and, and he did. He did ultimately re at the end because he was the one that died with the ring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Spoiler, Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! <laughs> <Come on. laughs> so I, yeah. I think uh, what I was saying. Most of my characters fall into the category. I haven't yet wrote, wrote a character chaotic evil. I don't know if you can do that yet in middle grade, but maybe. Yeah, you no, can. not so much. If you drown a cat in middle grade, they probably won't classify as middle grade. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think what makes a villain so interesting is like what Tyler said is they are they're complex. It's it's not black and white to them. So I'll give you a, a two in, examples. In middle grade, that's like the whole the whole thing is like the villain's like I'm gonna kill your cat. Yeah, I, that's I, like the whole villain. It is purpose. true. It's yeah, true. yeah. And at the end, they stop him. The cat is safe. Cat is safe. Cat never is <laughs> yeah. in danger. Cat's never really in danger. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so in, in the potion, ma my potion master series, there's. Gordy's grandfather is a guy named Meserix, and he was a, uh, a pretty bad dude um, in, in this community, in, this, in, in the world I've created. Uh, bad potion masters are usually brought before court, and they're banished, and they're exiled to areas where they can't brew potions or whatever. So he's been exiled for as long as Gordy. And Gordy has no idea he even exists. He thought his grandfather worked, uh, worked with 
farming equipment and died in the farming accident, and then he finds out that he's actually alive. And I think he was interesting for me to write because he loves his family. He's all about family. He's, he's excited about Gordy's potential, but he's ultimately, he wants this chaos. He does want the great chaos. He wants to eliminate governments, eliminate prisons, eliminate secrets, and then his belief is when all that's gone, it's kind of uh, the, the cream will rise to the top, and those that are meant to survive will survive, and he will be, because he's mm -hmm. the best. Um, he feels that we're the only species um, on the planet that put all these restrictions. Everywhere else, it's you know, it's survival of the fittest. Um, so I think that made him interesting because he has yeah. a good idea, and there's lots of like you said, there's lots of followers that think that's a great idea. It's kind of bad how he's doing it, um, and then he has a love for his family. The other thing I created in the Afterlife Academy. You see the perspective from the demons. Um, there's a, a book that opens the gateway to let these demons run crazy, and a 12-year-old boy finds it, and so he needs a guardian agent to protect him, but he's also 12, so there's middle grade, uh, there's uh, middle school drama, bullies and girls and, and demons, you know? And so I, I thought it was interesting, and it was my publisher that really helped me come up with this idea. Boonga, who's the main demon, he loves to torture. Of course, again, yeah. don't say torture in middle grade, you can't. Really can unless it's no. a nonfiction. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so I still wanted him to be this type of guy that tortured. So what he did, he tortures the demons with board games. They hate human things, and so he has Jenga and Monopoly, and that drives them crazy. And he forces them to these, you know, these uh, uh, Iron Maiden things, and he makes them play board games. And I thought that was it. That made it more interesting because it's funny, but it's also saying he. I want to torture you, but I love, he gets excited when he gets a new board game. Like he opens up the bags of the little of little mansions. He's so excited because I can just see the torture this is going to cause yeah. the people that I want to torture. So. so Frank did something there that I love, and that is where you take your your initial idea when you're writing, like, ah, this, this demon's going to torture, right? And then, But then you think, how what does torture look like in my world building? Um, and how can I innovate on this idea and, and make it something unique? Right, and that's so cool. Like that, I think that's yeah. So you, you find something that makes it your own take spin on it, and then um, and that adds depth to your character. So suddenly, I like this Huma guy. He's funny, and he has a little sidekick named Trudy. That's a little demon that's obnoxious. So you see their perspective. And you're like, oh, they're funny. I, I like them, but they're also trying to kill everybody. And so you know, there's that. <laughs> there's that. Um, I wanted to talk for a second. Oh, I wanted to talk about. But, um, we did that one, right? No, we didn't. Did we do that one? No, we didn't. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about, for a second, turning points, and, uh, or also often called epiphanies for characters. I think that Pixar does this extremely well, and, like, most, most... You don't, you don't go wrong with Pixar. Right, like, like they, think, they think about, when I think about epiphany moments, or, like, turning point moments, I think of, uh, what's the word? Joy. Inside out. I was yes, say, inside out. Yeah. yeah, when when she's down in the pit, and, you know, uh, who's your friend that likes to play bing bong, bing bong, <laughs> and, right? And they power up the bing bong thing, and they fly up, right? That's that's like the, the turning point, the epiphany for that character. Um, they all they always have the habits. There's like every one of those Pixar movies has has an epiphany moment where the character realizes something that changes their life or changes their internal view of the world. Um, it's a turning point, right? And I actually, like, I call it, I think the arc of pretty much every Pixar movie looks like this. It's like, uh, starts out, um, and there's there's conflict. Uh, the character works through the conflict, and it gets uh, really good, really good. And things seem to be super peachy, and then all of a sudden, something uh, happens, and the character plunges lower than they were at the beginning. And down here, they have an epiphany, which then shoots them up to, to higher heights. And if you watch, like, like think about, uh, should have re I should have watched every Pixar movie before I came to <laughs> re -watch. Do it now. Uh, but I'm thinking of, like, Monsters, Inc., right, um, where, you know, Sully and Mike have a uh, fight. Maybe at Monsters University, right? And it plunges them down. He's not a scare. He's not, it's Monsters University. He's not going to be a scare because uh, he's not scary. Right, and then at the end, he kind of realizes that he doesn't need to be scary in the same sense or whatever, and shoots him up. 
It's, it's, like, it's like Toy Story with Buzz. Yes. With Buzz. Yes. yes. He finally exactly. realizes I'm not a real space ranger, mm -hmm. and he's and he's out. But then he realizes I can still be a good toy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and Woody has to realize like I might not be Andy's favorite toy, but I can still be an awesome toy. And then they shoot up together. And it, it always seems like things are going. When you know at the three quarter mark of a Pixar movie, things are going really well. Watch like, watch any. Pretty much any Pixar movie. And you're about to have an emotional. And you'll breakdown. see that things are going really pretty good at the three quarter mark. And then, yeah, and then there's some sort of emotional breakdown that plunges the characters down deep. And in the depths is where they will always find their epiphany. They'll always have their epiphany or, or their turning point down there. They'll learn something so important about themselves, often. It's almost always about themselves. Almost always, yeah. And then as they do that, it shoots them up to new heights. I was going to say something on that, too. Yeah. Oh, do you want to finish something first? Well, no, it ties us into oh, yeah. internal external. Well, I was going to say something on that, too. You, you mentioned it earlier, Hiccup from... Yes, uh, I know. Out of oh, I love Hiccup. <laughs> One of my all-time favorite moments in cinema was when... So Hiccup in How to Train Your Dragon, he's a very analytical guy. He's reading, he draws, he creates a journal about dragons. He studies who they, what they are. He, he understands that he has no ability to kill dragons, he feels weaker than everyone else, but he thinks that he can figure out a way to fly and ride on this dragon if he creates all the tools and he follows the guideline. And at that moment when he's flying, it's actually working and the map pulls away. And I remember it's also he's like, forget it, and he just starts going and, and I get chills thinking about it. Me too. Because the music was awesome too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's like, Ooh. but at that moment he realizes that I need to let this go and, and go with instinct. And I think you can do that with your character, but first you have to create a lot of obstacles. Create obstacles where they're going to beat up against a wall and they can't do it, and then they get down into their pit and they find a way out of it. Well, I erased it too soon. That, but there's a pit there. I there's a pit. You see the pit? There's yeah. a beat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but um, speaking, that's my. I definitely know that movie better than any other movies. I think. I, well, and you should see his Halloween costume. He was uh, toothless. toothless. <laughs> yeah, uh, but they're uh, in that movie. If you look at it. He's, he's not happy because he can't kill a dragon. Okay, then, then Dad leaves, and he finds Toothless, and he starts working with Toothless. He learns their secrets. He starts to rise in dragon training, right? And he's doing really good in dragon training. He's the talk of the town. Stoic comes home, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, he's a celebrity. Your son's so awesome. Everything's really, really great, right? What's coming? You know what's it's coming. He, he's finally the day you have to fight, the, you get to kill your first dragon. And he tries, and he's in the ring, and he won't do it. Toothless shows up. They knock him out. And they he loses take, his dragon. He loses basically. his dragon. They take Toothless away, and Hiccup plunges. And he's standing on the edge, and Astrid walks up and says, uh, what are you going to do? And he says, I don't know, something stupid, I guess. And she says, <laughs> <laughs> and she says well, you've already done that. And then he says, then something amazing, right? And, and that comes right after he says, um... Uh, 500 years of dragons, and I can't kill. 500 years of Vikings, and I can't kill a dragon. And she says, first, first one to ride, ride one, though. Oh, and that gives you chills, yeah. too. First, first, first to ride one, though. And that's the turning point for him, right? And then you see it in his eye, and he starts to bounce, his little makeup bounce. And then, boom! And then all of a sudden, yeah, he gets his buddies on the little dragons, and they and they go, and they fight the big red dragon, or and they win. Yep. Yeah. I think that I think that actually is the perfect... You should draw that picture back in. <laughs> Let's do it in dual colors. <laughs> I think for for all of you writing, YA adult, Starts out uh, middle grade, this is a perfect. It doesn't always have to follow this Things pattern. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they go back down real bad, and then back up the blue. It looks like one of those, oh, it's like a heart thing. <laughs> and, and, that's when, and that's when they're, uh, that's when the defibrillator brings them back. <laughs> but I think that. That actually, if you can look at your, your character and say, does my character follow this? Um, and if not, why? You know, maybe it doesn't have to follow that exactly. Like we said, not every story follows that character. Maybe they start off low um, and things go good. And then at some point, something has to bring them below bottom. And then they have to have a moment where they rise up. And then you're going to have a great character. You're going to have someone that people, have, it has rootability because you see them start low, gain something and get it taken all away. Yeah. And then they go and get it back or they get something better. And they realize that maybe what they had wasn't what they wanted anyways. 
Yeah, because Toothless, or Hiccup doesn't get it back, right? He doesn't get, like, well, in a way he gets his fame back. He doesn't get, he doesn't, he's not the dragon slayer, slayer that everyone he's, thought he was. Yeah. Now, I've, I've converted my village into dragon lovers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of ties us into another thing I wanted to talk about, which was internal and external stakes. Because I feel like, so it, when we talk about that, internal stakes are things that are happening in, in a character's emotions, right? What is at stake emotionally for this character? Or what does this character want to know about themselves? Internal things that they keep to themselves. External stakes are like, oh, if we don't, you know, if we don't throw this ring in the lava, then the world's gonna get destroyed. Right? That's, stakes. That's an external stake, because like things, you know, the world's gonna come to a close. Uh, my Witchmakers series, the duology, was created actually completely around this idea I started with the concept of well, the external stakes are that the character has seven days to complete a quest. He has a genie that he found living in a peanut butter jar, and he has seven days to complete a quest. And if he fails, the external stakes are that all of the cats and dogs in the world will turn to zombies and devour mankind. And so, so just a timeout. Writing middle grade, the weird. Weirder the yeah. better. Yeah, weird. Weird stuff. Time back in. <laughs> weird stuff. And so, and so, those are the external stakes, right? He's got to accomplish a physical quest, go to point A, to point B, to point C, accomplish these tasks to stop the world from ending. External. Those are the external stakes. His internal stakes are that he doesn't know who he is or where he came from, and he has no memories before age nine, and he's been an orphan and living with, in foster care for three years, his internal stakes are very much, I need to find out who I am. And in the second book, um, so I actually planned uh, planned the, the big twist as at this moment here, he realizes kind of the second, he realizes his internal stakes and the external stakes and often they resolve each other simultaneously. Like when you, when you learn the epiphany about yourself, <laughs> and you learn what it is that makes you rise back up to the top and overcome the fall that you just had, in doing that, you will often not only resolve your internal conflicts, but you will have then the ability so, yeah. to resolve your external conflicts, right? The external conflict in How to Train Your Dragon was that there was a giant dragon queen thing, and it was all the other dragons were subservient to it. And Hiccup, when he found out about himself, that he might not be a dragon slayer, but he's the first to ride one, then is armed with the power to fly and destroy the big dragon that's that's causing all the trouble. And he's, he resolves his internal stakes, standing on the edge, looking out as the ships are sailing away with his dragon. And then he resolves his internal stakes, or external, external stakes, when he and his buddies go and take down the big bad. Good. So I feel like internal stakes and external stakes you can't be like, oh, I'm going to have a book with just external. external stakes. You might be able to write a book with just internal stakes. You think, you think about Lord of the Rings, and you think about external stakes, and, and those are pretty high. But there are so many internal stakes. What's what's driving Frodo? Yeah. It's the feeling of loss. You know, he's losing the Shire. The Shire. That's what that's his home. He's losing everything. And and I think that's that's huge in that. We realize, yeah. you know, that's what he's, and, it, and he never really never gets it back. And then you watch the movie, it ends for <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and so I feel like uh, as you think about creating your own characters, ask yourself: Are my characters going on an arc? And what does the arc look like? Where 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 are they going emotionally? Are there internal stakes for my character? Are there external stakes for my character? Um, and then the biggest thing, the number one thing for me for characters is one word. Um, Motivation, right? For me, that is where everything about characters revolves around motivation. If you have a properly motivated character, that that character wants to go and do something, then your readers are going to root for them because they're motivated sufficiently. Um, and, and there's just a lot of problems that can be solved by asking yourself, what is my character's motivation in doing this? 
if the answer is because I need this to happen in the story, then that's probably not the right thing. So the goal, the piggyback on that, I think I know we're not talking about conflict, but I think conflict drives our characters. And some questions you can ask for the motivation is why is this happening? Why is it happening now? And to, to, you, to the characters that are involved, why is it happening to them? If, is it completely coincidental, or if, are there factors that, you know, like in Magic's Most Wanted, this kid's been talked about for a long, long time, you didn't even realize it. And then what happens if your character, you're not really remember it, right? Well, I like how you cross the A, though. I do, that's, a, that's, a, that's an accent. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> if your other one there, too. Okay, if your character <laughs> fails. And I think that is good motivation. So if they don't succeed, what is the result? You know, And if your character, it doesn't matter if they fail, then maybe that's not a great conflict. Maybe your character's not invested enough in the, in the story. So it should be, if my character fails at whatever it is that I'm trying to do, this is what's going to happen. You know, Maybe it's all the cats and dogs eat everybody. That's pretty, that's pretty good motivation. But I think that... That drives your character up. If I fail, this is what happens. And so ask yourself those questions. Why is it happening? Why is it happening now? What happens if my characters fail? Yeah, because when in in Wishmakers, when the character leaves the house to go on his quest, he says to the reader, um, like, I'm I don't want the world to end. I don't want cats and dogs to turn to zombies and devour mankind. But that's not the reason I'm actually going. All right, like he doesn't even know if he can stop that world-ending catastrophe. He doesn't even know if he believes that that would happen. Instead, he says the real reason I'm going is because I finally have a genie. That genie can grant me answers, and I might be able to, along this journey, find out who I am and where I came from. And then when he when he realizes an internal struggle and he and he overcomes that, he understands how to save the extra one. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and I have in Magic's Most Wanted, there's a character who. Uh, her motivation is a little bit hidden. Uh, she's helping, she's a junior detective, and she's helping the, uh, Mason, the main character, try to clear his name. And he keeps, she keeps saying, we've got to do this, we've got to, we've got to find the next clue, we've got to solve this. And he keeps saying, to clear my name, right? And she's like, uh, yeah, 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 that's why we're doing that. Right? And, and uh, really, she has ulterior motives. She has internal, she's not the viewpoint character. But even a secondary you can, character, you can tell by reading that there's something going on. She there. has ulterior motives. She has she has motivation for herself beyond and a secret and a secret. Yeah, and and, and beyond just helping. Yeah, yeah. So we well, yeah, like five minutes for, for, for yeah, yeah Q and A real quick for That's it. to try to keep. Uh, well, we're doing a big Q and A after generally writing and stuff. But if you have especially character based questions or things like this. Um, I think about um, the antagonist a lot because I feel like without a good antagonist, your protagonist kind of no point. Well, I mean, yeah. there's point, but no motivation. Yeah, yeah. but to have that good um, antagonist to drive the story, what are your thoughts or feelings on creating um, that antagonist? Like, are you do you look at it? Well, in what way is more powerful having an antagonist who, let's say, is like the Joker, where they want to do evil just for evil's sake. Or, on the other hand, there's Thanos, who believes what they are doing is right, instead of in trying to go through whatever needs to be done to achieve their goal. I think it depends on the story that you're writing, but and, and you're going to have more success, I think, if you create someone that, that almost, if you wrote the story from their perspective, they're the hero. You know, if you write, yeah. if you're, if you're, they, it's, it's, if the book was in their hands and um, and you're reading it from their perspective, you're like, oh, okay, I can see why what, what they're doing is what they're doing. Um, and suddenly they're the hero of their own story. If you, if you write it that way and say, yes, I want to create chaos, but this is the reason why. Because for whatever, you know, A, B, and C. Um, and I also think giving them a reason, giving them, giving them um, characteristics that make them endearing to the reader. But still, kind of, I mean, you can still hate them. You know, maybe he has a moment. I'll give you an example. Uh, I think one of the cool in, in biblical and uh, uh, scriptural, there's that one moment. I think it's Paul and whatever his name was, Agrippa. Yeah. And he says, almost thou made me a Christian. 
there's that moment where he says, you almost got me. And you can see that he's probably having, oh, what he's saying is right. So if you're building at, moment, at moments and say, I think he's saying that it, what he's saying is right, but then I'm still too evil that I can't change. You know, I, there's still too much that I have vested in this that I can't change. I Dr. Can't, Doofenshmirtz. Dr. <laughs> Doofenshmirtz. <laughs> Right? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's always, we're always rooting for him, even yeah. though he's rooting for evil. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much of your characters are developed before you start writing them, and how much of your characters develop along the way? So, there are two ways to do this. Jeff Savage, J. Scott Savage, who is a friend of ours, writes a lot of middle grade. Um, he, I've been on panels with him before where he's said that he actually starts with the concept of a character. And then he builds a plot around that character. I tend to start with a plot, and then I have to find a character who is strong enough to hold up that plot, depending on how weird the plot is, right? <laughs> like, um, but for the first time ever, like I've been kicking around an idea in my mind, and it's the first time that I've had a story idea come to me that was character driven. And and now I'm now I'm starting to try to think of a plot that I can build around this character, which has never happened to me before, so it can go either way. So, so the book I'm writing right now, um, it's it's not here. It's definitely plot driven, but I needed they, I needed a certain character that wanted to write something different. I wanted to write a character that suffers from anxiety. So I sometimes suffer from anxiety and, and panic attacks. You know, like I said, I thought that would be interesting to write something like that to see how they overcome that because they may not have never overcome that. You may never be able to beat that, but maybe you can find a way to still succeed in the story. And I definitely don't want it to be all about panic attack, because I don't want that would, that would almost be a scientific book or something. Um, but I think most of my characters, though, they evolve. You know, uh, suddenly I realize at points, you know, I did not realize my character was going to do that. And yeah. I, I'm a discovery writer. I'm becoming more of a plotter, but I started out as a pantser. You guys know those terms, plotter and pantser, they're one? Yeah. Plotter means you you know everything's going to happen in your story. There are no surprises. If you sit down to write it, it happens. Maybe there's a few wiggle moments. Pants are someone who's like, I sit down, I didn't know that at the beginning of the day what was going to happen at the beginning of the day. And I do that. I, I wrote books and I would I tell my wife that I would say, hey, uh, I think this is what's going to happen. She said, great. And then I'd read it to her later and say, that's not what happened. I'm like, I know. <laughs> it just changed. You know, like, well, you're the writer. I'm like, I know. But that's a pantser. And publishers? I think don't love pantsers, right? Especially under contract. Like, hey, we want a book from you. What's it going to be about? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Just give me money, and we'll figure it out. You know. <laughs> Can we do one more question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you create a character for an adult novel versus a character for like the middle grade? Is there a difference? Huge. Yeah. Huge yeah. difference. Um, like as a main main character. Yeah. So uh, the main character I feel should always be. There are exceptions, but. You should always have your main character be the age of your intended readers, or possibly a year or two older. Yeah. Um, the rare exceptions are like Ender's Game, where Ender is like six years old, and it's really an adult book, right? That's uh, um, masquerading as a as a teen book. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, pretty yeah, 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 yeah. But but for the most part, I would say like find great book though. I love it. Yeah. Oh, it's... In case some Larson's watching. Uh, <laughs> but I. Uh, I I would say you always find a character that is on the same age as your. So if it's an adult book, it's probably going to be an adult. No, book. you're not going to be have, You're not going to have. You could have success. Anyone can have success yeah. in anything that you yeah. do. But the law of averages, you will not have success if you write an adult book where the main character is a kid, or if you write a kid book where the main character is an adult. You right. Just you just won't. It has happened, but the 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 odds are not in your. In fact, when you're writing middle grade, a huge thing, and I've actually taught a class on this, is like, how do you ditch the parents? Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> because that's the hardest thing in order. There's so many restrictions with yeah. parents. Or if or they're the not, then they're general. terrible parents. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, this is a book about a terrible parents. And it's like, how do you get these kids off on an adventure of their own without having to go home and explain and, and themselves and check in with their cell phone now? Because time. no yeah. one's going to believe it. If the kid doesn't have a cell phone. Right. He's 13 years old. Right. He doesn't have a cell phone. How are they? Getting in, in touch with them, which is why, like from the beginning, Magic Treehouse was was brilliant because they go in this Magic Treehouse and they're gone, and, they're gone, 
and then when they come back, really no time has passed, and Dad shouts, that's actually dinner is ready, you yeah. know. So that's the book I'm writing. Oh, no, no, I'm not writing Magic Tree House. That's good. You're writing Magic Tree yeah. Are you Mary Pope Osborne? I'm Mary Pope Osborne. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you write, you, you have to find a way. That's so important. Or James Dashner did it with the 13th reality. Um, Potion Masters, the adults do show up, but the main uh, there's a point where the kids have to be. Shine. Yeah, they have to shine. It's a middle grade book. Yeah. And they have to be by themselves, and they have to solve things. Uh, and they can't have a parent solve it for them. Right. And that's when you have a good middle grade story that kids will read and enjoy. Um, or they, they, they can live through vicariously through that character, because most of the time their parents are going to solve it. You know, most kids, their parents are going to be there until they're 18 years old to solve a lot of, not all, every kid, but a lot of them are. So in a middle grade story, if they can solve it, the kid can, you know, live through them. Yeah, we're out of time. But thank you for that excellent panel. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs>